We're back. This is again Behind the Bastards, the podcast where we talk about terrible people. And we're talking about Gabriel D'Annunzio, the inventor of fascism and the inventor of claiming you had two ribs removed to suck your own dick. Um, now, uh, Shireen, how are you feeling about this guy as we as we barrel into part two? You know, he's fascinating. I, I, he he's, is, he's fascinating, yeah. I am intrigued. Um, I thought he, I, I mean, I was learning, every second of the last episode got more absurd as we continued. Um, and it ended with me learning what he looked like. So now that I have an yeah. image in my head, it might be easier for me to imagine what he, what, how he's going about his life. Um, yeah, he's, he, his claim to fame, his, he has so many claim to fames, which is, he really does, which is crazy. Cause you would think, I don't know, uh, he, he wouldn't quit. He wouldn't quit. And I, I can't he, wait to learn how he, uh, literally invented fascism which is crazy yeah this he's got a lot of gas left in the tank this guy and you, he is he but is he's already did so much bullshit he already yeah. did so much bullshit he's lived a full life of bullshit and it's it's not even at the halfway point really his his productivity um, is, is is notable yeah. I'll, I'll give him that he's astonishing yeah astonishing now, for a little I, guy. I do want to say, like, as interesting as I find this guy, um, his biography, Gabriel D'Annunzio, uh, Poet, Seducer, and the Preacher of War by Lucy Hughes Hallett, I really recommend. Like, it's, it's one of the best biographies I've ever read. Wow. Um, like, very compulsively readable. Um, Hughes Hallett is a, is a fantastic writer and very uh, a very critical um, eye in a really interesting way. Like, I, I, I really appreciate her perspective on this guy. So I, I very much recommend that book. I mean, all the quotes you've read from it are, are amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Gabriel D'Annunzio loved planes. Loved planes. Big plane fan. Uh, he'd been an enthusiastic fan of the new technology since its inception. In 1909, he'd made headlines at a famous air show in Brescia for riding with an American aviator named Glenn Curtis over an adoring crowd of thousands. The seat he sat on during the flight was later auctioned off to his legions of adoring fans. Prior to World War I, Gabriel had repeatedly pressed the Italian government to start an air force. When the war started, Gabriel's enormous fame and belligerent speeches managed to secure him a lofty position in the Italian military. The government expected him to write a song of war, some brilliant poem that would light a fire in the hearts of the Italian soldiery and help to get the nations fully behind a war most of them still did not want. He was officially attached to the Third Army, as staff to the Duke of Iosta, but he was given unlimited freedom to basically do whatever he wanted. He could go to any part of the front he desired, partake in any maneuvers or actions he wanted to partake in. His job was generally to inspire the military in whatever way seemed interesting to him. So... That's the job this guy gets at the start of World War I. Gabriel's first trip up to the front was delayed by the difficulty he had designing and hiring someone to sew his custom uniforms. He eventually solved that problem, while thousands of his countrymen dashed themselves to bloody chunks in Austrian machine gun nests. He spent so much time waiting at a fancy hotel to get all of that sorted out that, yet again, he went broke. His manager suggested he go to Third Army headquarters and start working. He'd get free food and lodging and be paid. But once he arrived in Venice, the closest city to the front, he yet again set him up in the fanciest possible hotel. Uh, as much of an incorrigible dandy as he was, D'Annunzio's writing during this period shows he was eager to actually take part in war. On his way to the front, he wrote in his notebook, Sense of emptiness and distance. Life and the reasons for living elude me. Between two streams, between past and future, tedium, lukewarm water, necessity for action. Surprisingly, this was not just bluster. Two days after reaching Venice, he was on a naval destroyer doing night maneuvers, heading towards the Austrian coast. And like two weeks before he did this, one of those destroyers had been sunk by a mine and dozens of guys had died. So this was a very dangerous thing to do. Um, his trip wound up not having any combat in it, but he later spent time up at the front lines where he was under machine gun fire and artillery shelling regularly. He made friends and he saw them die horribly. Um, and none of this dimmed Denuncio's ardor for war. Lucy Hughes Hallett writes, Blessed are those who are now 20 years old, he said. He worshipped and envied their beauty and took enormous pleasure in the opportunities that war afforded him to live alongside them as companions in arms. Their deaths were marvelous to him. When they were killed, as one after another they were, he took them into the pantheon he was elaborating in his writing and speeches, making them the martyrs and cult heroes of his new mythology of war. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> he's a guy. I mean, like, he's... He's doing exactly what he wants, which is like infuriating, you know? He like, does that's his whole life. Yeah. 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 Now, 
Gabrielle is, is is enticing as he found the front lines. Uh, he had no desire to actually take part in trench combat because it led to th- all everyone dying basically anonymously in huge groups. And mm-hmm. if there's one thing he could not stand, it was being part of a large anonymous group of men. Yep. Um, he had t- yeah. So he decided that the sky was more like the theater of war he wanted to get involved in. Um, it had nothing. Now, this choice like had nothing to do with cowardice, but it was intimately tied to his narcissism. He was absolutely willing to die, and flying in any any length of time was very dangerous at this period of time. Um, what he couldn't abide was dying anonymously, and pilots were at the time seen as the knights of the sky. So, if he died, you know, in a plane, that was a romantic enough death for him to be willing to like take the risk. Wow, very calculated. Yeah. He never learned to fly, but he figured he was more than capable of being a bombardier, basically dropping bombs by hand on targets, like while the guy in front flew. Um, And now up at the front, he'd befriended a pilot, uh, a guy named Miraglia, who told him that a bombing raid had been planned for the city of Trieste, Austria's chief port. The city had a large Italian population and was seen by people like Gabrielle as rightfully Italy's property. And Denunzio here was struck by a brilliant idea. Not only would he bomb the city, he'd also devise a way to airdrop propaganda onto Trieste to try and incite the Italian citizens to rise up against their government. This was not an easy mission. No Italian pilot had ever flown this far in a single trip, and there would be numerous machine guns protecting the port itself from aerial attack. It was an insanely dangerous gambit, seen as suicidal by many, and Miraglia and Denunzio would be undertaking this mission alone. Obviously, the attack had little military value, but the propaganda value of dropping bombs on the Austrian emplacements and propaganda for the Italian citizens was, in Gabriel's eyes, huge. For days, he agonized over how to drop the leaflets, which he wrote himself. He eventually went with tiny sandbags that would help the leaflets fall on target rather than getting blown to and fro. The message itself was titled, To the Italians of Trieste, and promised an imminent liberation. Each copy was handwritten by him, a sign of how much the project mattered in Gabriel's eyes. Once it became clear that what they planned to do, of course, the admiral in charge of Italy's air force tried to put a stop to it. So did the government. No one with any measure of power wanted Gabriel D'Annunzio, Italy's most famous living poet and writer, to die flying over Austria. Morale was bad enough after the glorious war against Austria had turned almost instantly into a blood-soaked stalemate. Instead, they wanted him to sit in his hotel room and write the damn poem they'd been counting on him to write to help motivate the war effort. But now, up at the front... Gabriel D'Annunzio found himself unable to write. I have a horror of sedentary work, of the pen, of the ink, of paper, of all those things now become so futile. A feverish desire for action takes me. D'Annunzio protested against being grounded, and a battle ensued behind the scenes of the military brass. Eventually, D'Annunzio went to the prime minister and tried flattery. And here's how Lucy Hughes Hallett describes it in one of the most deliciously catty sections of her book. (laughs) You, whose own spirit is so hardworking and so generous, must understand me. He stressed his physical competence. He was not a man of letters as of the old type and skullcap and slippers. He was an adventurer. My whole life has been a risky game. He boasted of his past daring. I have exposed myself to danger a thousand times against the fences and hedges of the Roman Campania. He adored fox hunting. In France, he had (laughs) often been out on the Atlantic in chancy weather, as the fishermen of the Landes could tell you. He had ventured repeatedly into enemy territory on the Western Front. He visited the front twice, staying on the safer side of the French lines. Most importantly, I am an aviator. I have flown many times at high altitude. This wasn't strictly true either. And he wasn't only brave. He had knowledge and skills which could be useful. He knew Istria. He knew Trieste. He had an observant spirit. Having presented his credentials, he made his request in the most insistent terms. I pray, I beg, repeal this odious veto. He hinted that if he were not allowed to risk his life in his own way, he would deliberately endanger it by going straight to the front. To bar one with my past, my future, from living the heroic life would be to cripple me, to mutilate me, to reduce me to nothing." And the prime minister was apparently impressed by his ardor, and permission was granted for the raid. So he he gets his way, as he always time, does his entire every life. Time. Yeah, every I love, single time. I love her her way of writing that, though. I love that she's yeah. just like, I, I imagine in my head, in like in parentheses, being like all this yeah. like, side note, like, not true. Um, the whole biography is written with the air of like, yeah, she's just utterly unimpressed by a lot of this guy's life. I love um, that. I love that. But a lot. also fascinated by him and compelled to chronicle it. It's an interesting book. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I will say, like in my brain, when you were talking about him dropping uh, propaganda from a plane, I was th- I was thinking like he might as well be dropping poetry books. Like, isn't that one yeah. of the same? Isn't that kind of what they wanted him to do, regardless? Like, isn't like it's 
they huh. wanted him to inspire the people of Italy. Um, because like the, the, most Italians weren't really on board with the war. Like mm-hmm. he was able to get a lot of them in the cities on board, but like most people in Italy were like, "Why are we? Why would we get involved in this stupid thing? Yeah. Why would we like send our sons off to die for this?" So that's what the government wanted was him to convince them of that. Mm-hmm. And instead, he really wants to go be in danger. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. He, he just likes being a contrarian, probably. That's part of it. Yeah. So Gabriel uh, and his pilot set off on August 7th, and what followed was an outrageously dangerous adventure. They were shot at several times, and at least one bullet struck the plane. Just flying 150 kilometers in that period of time was very risky, and it's really impossible to overstate just how fucking dangerous this was. At one point, a bomb got stuck on the plane, and Denunzio had to dislodge it, an act that could have easily led to the bomb exploding and killing he and his pilot. Um, I'm emphasizing the danger here because I want to make it clear that with his actions, Gabriel D'Annunzio did prove that his rhetoric wasn't empty. He was not the sort of guy who would urge others on to war and then stay safely in the background. Mm -hmm. Um, He repeatedly risked his life over the course of World War I, but the attack on Trieste was probably the most insanely dangerous act of his life. When he landed safely after dropping propaganda and bombs on Trieste and the news broke of his new exploit, D'Annunzio was more famous than ever. He became the idol of the Italian public, the nation's single greatest living hero. Wow. He could barely go out in public without being mobbed. And he continued to fly, or at least let others fly him. He dropped numerous bombs and fired machine guns, but his highest preference was at deploying propaganda. D'Annunzio was well ahead of the curve on recognizing this as the weapon of the future. And his most famous action was dropping leaflets over Vienna, the Austrian capital, near the end of the war. The propaganda would be almost the last significant uh, written work of Gabriel's life. As the New Republic notes, in January 1916, he suffered a detached retina during an air raid and was forced to lie absolutely still for several months to save his other eye. During his enforced convalescence, he composed a text of po- in poetic verse, uh, prose written line by line on slips of paper handed to him by his daughter Renata. These formed the basis for his memoir, Noturno, which appeared in 1921 and has recently been published in supple English translation by Stephen Sartorelli. It was Denunzio's entry into the stream of consciousness sweepstakes, his most openly modernist work, admired by many, including Hemingway, in spite of the fact that he considered its author a jerk. Naturno is Denunzio's last major contribution to literature. So, like, wow. yeah, I mean, he, God, he's just praised as a god his entire fucking life. And I think a part yeah. of the reason why he risked his life, I don't think he was actually ready to die. I think he just feel, he felt invincible. And I think he... Yeah, that might have been it. Yeah, I mean, like, I just think there's so much... Um, I don't know. Your your brain is a powerful thing, and if you actually think you're invincible, I think there's an element that like it, you will you'll be fine. Like it, it's your whole life, you've gone away with every fucking thing. You're not gonna die in a plane, and I don't think he was. He I don't think he. I think he knew the whole time he was never gonna die. I don't know. I wonder. I don't he know. wrote a lot about being convinced that he would die on these missions, and they were very dangerous. But it is impossible to know like how he really felt in the center of right. his heart, because like obviously you would have to write about being certain you were going to die. Because right. part of what you're trying to do is convince other men to go into situations where they'll probably die. And, I, and I'm sure it was extremely dangerous, and I'm sure it was outrageously so, like yeah. very fright, frightening and everything. But I do think there's an element to his personality where he just thinks he's invincible. Uh, because he's gotten away with so much shit and he literally lands and his life starts over again he's a god you know what i mean like it's like exactly what he's been since birth yep and this like really is the end of his period of time as a writer and an artist of note like he stops really producing work after world war one and like especially he stops producing his best work um and while the war, the end of the war more or less brought about the end of Gabriel's career as an artist, it was not the end of his career as an asshole who shoved his dick into world affairs. Italy wound up on the winning side of World War I, but they were by far the junior partner on their side of the war. The French, British, and Russians rightly viewed them as turncoats, who got in late and sacrificed far fewer men than their allies. As a result, Italy got very little in the way of new territory at the end of the war. Gabriel D'Annunzio considered this a mutilation, a disgusting stab in the back after all the sacrifices he'd convinced his countrymen to make. One of the things that infuriated him most was the fact that the territory of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was being broken up and given to its own people. He was livid at the establishment of a Slavic state in the Balkans, and particularly livid at the fact that the city of Fiume, with an sizable Italian population, would be a part of that state. 
Gabriel D'Annunzio decided he was not going to take this lying down, so he decided to raise an army and conquer the city for Italy on his own. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the balls on this guy. Uh, I mean, you can see him in the banana hammock. They're yeah, not they're, tiny. They're they're good, good, good old size balls. Good old they're, balls. They're huge. Yeah. Um. Wow. Yeah. He I'm going to quote from just, the New Republic here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please, please. Yeah. He called on the Italian government to occupy the city, and in September 1919, after they failed to do so, he took matters into his own hands. He marched on fume at the head of a cadre of Arditi, or daredevil stormtroopers, clad in the black and silver uniforms and black fezes that would be aped, like so much that was Denunzio, by the fascists. Greeted with cheers by the Italian-speaking locals, Denunzio announced that he had annexed fume, expecting the government would take control, but there was no reaction. Suddenly, the poet-politician found himself in charge of a city in the grip of a delirious cocaine-enhanced Bacchanal. Eventually, Fume, with Denunzio as its deuce, declared its independence. Huh. Yeah. I keep wanting to, like, analyze this guy, like, really... Okay, I, th- I think his his fame when he was a poet were... It was it was revered and beautiful. Like, like, like a beautiful... Like, a, like, not beautiful, sorry, I thought the word I'm trying... It was He was revered as this, like, artistic guy, and it was this, like, kind of, like... A fan base that was passionate and would read his stuff, thought he was sexy, whatever. But now this kind of fame, this lesion, is this violent thing that I think he's always wanted. He's always wanted to command people that will do whatever he says. And I think he got a taste of that as a, like, during the war. And it's scary the kind of power that this guy has that he, he's always had but in this scenario with violence and with with bringing people to literally make an army like he's always had some type of army is what i'm trying to say yeah his army as a poet was different than his army is uh, in this point of his life but it's a little scary just how um i don't know it seems like he's a really he's really obsessed with being this figure and it's because yeah. he's, he's doing he's really good at it I don't know. Well, and again, as is always the case with these guys, everyone kind of gives him what he wants. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like, obviously, what he did was profoundly illegal. And, like, the Allied forces were like, yeah, Fume has to go to Yugoslavia. You can't let him do this. And they sent an army to stop him when he was marching on the city. But that army was made up of Italians, and they loved Denunzio. They refused to attack him, and hundreds of soldiers deserted to join his army as he marched on the city. That is absurd power. That's crazy. It's almost incomprehensible. Wow. Um, yeah. And and so in the fall of 1919, Gabriel D'Annunzio found himself as the dictator of a small state on the Mediterranean coast. <laughs> oh my God. He was... <laughs> this guy's this fucking life. Guy. <laughs> this guy's life. Jesus. Wow. Oh, uh, it's something else. Um, he was 56 years old and powerfully ill with the flu as his forces marched into town. The people of Fume did not notice his infirmity. They were enormous fans of the celebrity poet, and thousands of them stayed up all night specifically so they could welcome their new dictator home with rapturous applause. His soldiers were greeted in the streets with women wearing evening dresses and carrying guns, ready to party or do battle against the Allies should they try to stop Denunzio. He announced the creation of a new city-state, which he believed would be a model for human society in the future. The state would be based around what he called the politics of poetry. Fume, he insisted, would be a searchlight radiant in the midst of an ocean of objection. He believed that what they built there would set a fire that would burn down the old order in the world. And so he declared Fume the city of the Holocaust. Wow. <laughs> that was cherry on top guy? of that fucking sentence. Jesus yeah, Christ. This fucking guy. Um, wow. In some ways, he's most similar to a guy like L. Ron Hubbard, who is like, you just kept accelerating right up until the end. Like, never take your foot off the gas. No. Like, not for a fucking second. Yeah. That is that is crazy. That It's wild. <laughs> what a journey. <laughs> And he's yeah. not even, he's he's st- he's young in comparison to the re- like you know, he's like he's only fifty yeah. something and he's a dictator like that's a yeah yeah Who, I'm sure I've got listeners in their fifties why haven't you taken over a small city on the Mediterranean yeah, why coast are you, and established you know, a, a, a republic of poetry yeah come on <laughs> lazy well. asses 
Now, uh, I'm going to quote again from Lucy Hughes. Oh, wait, no. It's uh, it's ad break time, isn't it? It is. Sophie? It is. It is. It is. All right. Well, you know what won't turn your city into a city of the Holocaust? Whoever Shireen. the ad is. Whatever exactly. the ad is. They will not do that. They will not. We do not. We do. That is one of our firm lines with advertisers. Do not no, endorse. No. Do not create cities of the Holocaust. Yeah. No. Okay. Anyway. See ya. <laughs> We're back. So uh, I want to start with reading a quote from Lucy Hughes Hallett on like what happens in Fume after after Gabrielle D'Annunzio takes over. Quote, the place became a political laboratory, socialists, anarchists, syndicalists, and some of those who had begun earlier that year to call themselves fascists congregated there. Representatives of Sinn Féin, uh, which is like an Irish Republican extremist group, and of nationalist groups from India and Egypt arrived, discreetly followed by British agents. Then there were the groups whose homeland was not of this earth, the union of free spirits tending towards perfection, who met under a fig tree in the old town to talk about free love and the abolition of money. And yoga, a kind of political cum uh, street gang described by one of its members as an island of the blessed in the infinite sea of history. Denunzian fume was a land of the cogne, an extra legitimate place where normal rules didn't apply. It was also a land of cocaine, fashionably carried in a little gold box in the waistcoat pocket. Deserters and adrenaline-starved war veterans alike sought a refuge there from the dreariness of economic depression and the tedium of peace. Drug dealers and prostitutes followed them into the city. One visitor reported he had never known sex so cheap. So did aristocratic dilettantes, runaway teenagers, poets and poetry lovers from all over the Western world. Fume in 1919 was as magnetic to an international confraternity of discontented idealists as San Francisco's hate Ashbury would be in 1968. But unlike the hippies, Denuncio's followers intended to make war as well as love. So it's this weird melting pot of like left wing radicals and yeah. right wing radicals who are all united in their idea that like fuck everything else that's going yeah. on. Let's all they're, take cocaine and in fuck and murder each other. They're just yeah. Desperation is a really dangerous uh, yeah. tool because I think similar to what you said in the last episode about like anger, like people really channeling, being able to like utilize the mass, the anger of the masses, and channel it in the right way. I think anger and desperation are really related in that regard because you can you can unify people with their desperation, and I think that's the yep. case with a lot of extremist groups, honestly. Uh, but, and it's also, yeah. it's important to note that Denunzio himself gets hugely into cocaine at this point. Like, he's a, be- not surprisingly, loves cocaine <laughs> and starts, like, <laughs> yeah, inhaling his fucking out. body weight every week and fucking in blow. Just like, and, and that's part of when you try to understand this place in this period, like, Denunzian fume, it, it floats on an ocean of blow. Like, mm-hmm. like uh, impossible amounts of cocaine is, wow. like, the only thing that would make an experiment like this possible. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds great. I actually would have loved to be there. <laughs> like, it sounds like it kind of rules. It sounds but. like, I mean, like, especially for the time, it sounds like this yeah. oasis in a, in a sea of, of yeah. dread, you know? Especially, Just people- I mean... It People was a safe making haven. art, yeah, yeah. It was well. It wasn't safe because there were also street gangs of fascists and it was anarchists it was gunning each other down. Yeah, it's just yeah. this lawless, bizarre place where everyone's making art and experimenting with new politics mm-hmm. and having gunfights and orgies and cocaine parties on an hourly basis. It's yeah. just incomprehensible. <laughs> that is his entire life. Honestly, I can't really wrap my head around it. I, every turn, yeah. I said this before, but every turn is more absurd than, than the next. Like I did not think this was going to go here in the beginning. Like that's crazy. He's a monster, but he's objectively one of the most fascinating people who ever lived. I like, 100% you can't read agree. his life and not be like, what the fuck dude? <laughs> like, he's 100%. Yeah. Like, like one there's... of the most fascinating people. Like a lot of historical figures like Hitler, as a historical figure, very compelling. As an individual, kind of a weird, boring, gross, sad life. Mm -hmm. Denunzio, a monster too, but like, fuck, what a, what a life. (laughs) Like you got to respect it. Like a lot of that. Like that's. You got to respect the hustle at least. That's just, it's, I, I, I'll give you that. I'll respect the hustle. And he's just problematic in so many ways. Jesus Christ. He's a monster. He's a monster. Wow. He's like L. Ron Hubbard, where he's like this terrible person, but you can't turn away from what he turned his life into. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it worked. So he, he got it, what he it, wanted every step of the fucking way. Every step of the fucking way, basically. 
Damn, does this guy not suffer? I'm waiting for this guy to suffer. Just well, give me that. we're getting to that a little okay. bit. A little bit. Denunzio wanted Fume to be a work of art made in the medium of human lives, and it was certainly something. Public life was described as a permanent street theater performance. There were constant orgies involving huge numbers of people, and of course, like all the cocaine in the world. Uh, there was also violence and constant murder by gangs of black-shirted thugs. But oddly, left and right found a way to meet in Fume. This was before fascism had really taken off, and right as communism was in the process of taking over Russia. The bizarre experiment in Fume attracted the support of literally every kind of extremist. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin sent Gabriel a pot of caviar and called him the only revolutionary in Europe. Benito Mussolini expressed his deep admiration of Denunzio, and the two began a long correspondence in letters. So, like, both Lenin and Mussolini love this guy and what he's doing in Fume. <laughs> um, it's so weird. <laughs> that is so bizarre. It's hard to wrap your head around. <laughs> yeah. you, so many people were obsessed with this guy. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking about what you said about Hemingway. Like, even like every type of person was like, gotta give it to him. But now there's like okay. Mussolini and Lenin. Like, what the? Jesus. You can't ignore Denunzio. Like, that, no. and that's what Denunzio wants. You have to like stare at him. You can't not. He's just this. He's a f- this, he's just like a peacock. He's pe- he peacocked yeah. his entire life. He peacocked the entirety of Europe, yeah. which is quite an accomplishment. Yeah. God. So, fun as it sounds, Fume was not a paradise. Syphilis was astonishingly rampant, and Denunzio <laughs> could be yeah, like everybody including Denunzio got syphilis. Well, <laughs> when you said how Obviously. many partners he had, I wanted to yeah. ask like th- he must have had some type of consequence. Like there must he, have been he something was, he was after a thousand 80%, partners. Yeah. Like, His body weight was 70% like sexually transmitted uh, infections. Like uh, he was more chlamydia than man. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, and Denunzio <laughs> could also be a brutal ruler. Midway through 1916, he held a plebiscite promising to hand over control of the city to someone else if the people no longer wanted him in charge. And he lost the plebiscite. But he did not give up power. His centurions of death, an elite corps of black-shirted thugs, kept the city under his control. And during this period, Gabriel also introduced an innovation that everyone today is tragically, agonizingly familiar with. The Roman salute. I was going to say now, the iPhone. Now, most people... But... No. <laughs> Most people know the Roman salute better as the Nazi salute, that weird, creepy, straight arm salute that fascists and Border Patrol employees do. Yeah, he invented that. He invented lying about removing your ribs to suck your dick and the fascist salute. Holy like, both shit. Of those are the same Holy guy. Holy shit. I yeah. had no idea that one person was capable of achieving so much. Uh, it's amazing. That is. Oh, my. I'm. Hitler yeah. gets way too much credit. Yeah, it, it, fucking Denunzio, yo. Wow. Now, um, I, I'm going to read a quote from Count Carlos Forza, uh, an Italian diplomat and an anti-fascist politician who was a contemporary of Denunzio's. Um, he wrote, quote, It was he who at Fume invented that Roman salute, which has now become also the German salute, and which he, overlooking its implications, copied from some statue or fresco, forgetting that in Rome, the cives, the citizens, greeted each other by shaking hands, and that only slaves made the sign which has been adopted by the subjects of Mussolini and Hitler. So they were very condescending as far as like this... Like, he didn't know. He liked the way it looked in statues, and mm-hmm. so he made his people do it, and it took off with Mussolini's fascists, and then with Hitler's fascists, and now with uh, Border Patrol employees. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, yeah. Wow. I Amazing. Am- Literally every second of this podcast, it's, I get my jaw wild. drops to the floor. I wish, <laughs> I wish this this call was recorded because my face just literally contorts and like my mouth is agape for so much of what you're saying. Like I cannot believe yeah. this guy's life. <sighs> it's something else. Damn. Immediately after taking power, Denunzio's first action was to establish a press office, which he used to send out communiques to governments and politicians and media outlets around the world. Journalists flocked to the city, as well as political extremists. Gabriel offered to arm the IRA with some of the tens of thousands of rifles his forces had captured. He entertained grand visions of invading England, which he hated, at the head of an Irish army. But the IRA was a little too smart for that. They wanted guns, but Gabriel's hatred of the United States was seen as potentially alien the nation they saw as their greatest ally. 
Mussolini at one point wrote to him and suggested the two of them should work to overthrow the Italian monarchy and establish a directory, essentially a powerful fascist central government. Remarkably, Benito didn't see himself as the head of this organization. He wanted to make Denunzio the dictator. But Gabriel was, at least, loyal to the Italian throne and was unwilling to take part in such a revolution. In November of 1920, Osbert Sitwell, an English writer, joined the crowds of journalists and revolutionaries who'd come to fume. His goal was to see what the man who has done more for the Italian language than any writer since Dante had done with a nation of his own. And Lucy Hughes Howlett writes, quote, Sitwell finds the streets full of colorful desperados. Every man seemed to wear a uniform designed by himself. Some wore beards and had shaven heads like the commander. Others cultivated huge tufts of hair, half a foot long, waving out from their foreheads, and a black fez at the back of the head. Cloaks, daggers, and flowing black ties were universal, and all carried the Roman dagger. Sitwell succeeds in securing an audience. He passes through a pillared hall full of palm trees and pseudo-Byzantine flower pots, where soldiers lounged and typists rushed furiously in and out. In an inner room, almost entirely covered with banners, he finds two more than life-size carved and gilded saints from Florence, a huge 15th-century bronze bell, and the commandant, as Denunzio now likes to be called, in military gray-green, his chest striped with ribbons of his many medals. He seems nervous and tired, but bald and one-eyed as he is, at the end of a few seconds one felt the influence of that experience extraordinary charm, which has enabled him to change howling mobs into furious partisans. Since Sitwell arrived in Fume, the great conductor, Arturo Toscanini, has brought his orchestra to the town. To celebrate Toscanini's visit, D'Annunzio lays on a mock battle, which is as lethal as an ancient Roman circus. 4,000 men take part, attacking each other with real grenades. The orchestra, which initially provides a musical accompaniment, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, becomes involved in the fighting. Over 100 men are injured, including five musicians. Now D'Annunzio discussing the event with Sitwell, explains that his legionnaires are weary of waiting for battle. They must fight one another. What the fuck? <laughs> I have so many this questions. This fucking guy, yeah. Okay, first, I remember you said that he didn't even like politics. No, but this is not politics. This is being worshipped by a whole city and having them fight for his amusement. It's, he and loves fucking being them. a god. For, he for, loves, he's basically a god. For someone who yeah. hates religion, for someone who hates religion as much as he does, he yeah. loves being worshipped. His religion I, I, is just culty yeah. and... Worship of himself. Yeah. Absolutely. And like I've heard it said that like, you know, the rock stars of like the 60s and mm-hmm. 70s, like the Beatles and the Stones and like the, the Pink Floyd and stuff like those guys got about as close to being a god as anyone has ever gotten. Yeah. I think Denunzio is the closest any human has ever experienced to re- like, like, at I least agree. in the modern era, you know, maybe earlier agree. when people were literally worshipped. But like in every field, that's the thing that's yeah. wild in every field imaginable. He was worshipped. My other question yeah. is, he so he actually lost his eye? So he was bedridden, yeah. but then he lost the eye? Yeah, he so lost he ha- one eye. So now he's even weird, weirder looking than he was before. He's just like, yep, yeah. does he wear a patch? Is he a pirate? I think he wears a glass eye. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know what? He's probably still fucking too, so. Yeah. Oh, he is fucking constantly. Wow. He never stops fucking. Like, That's Denunzio stamina, is though. always fucking. Yeah. Did he also invent Viagra? What's next? What what what, what turn are you going I, to give me next? <laughs> I, I do kind of feel like he was one of the people who never really needed that. Like he <sighs> was the horniest man who ever lived. Like that is that is Gabriel Denunzio. God. <laughs> Now, this whole deliriously mad state of affairs lasted only a few more weeks. In January of 1921, pressed by the League of Nations, the Italian government finally took action against its native son. They sent a gunboat and soldiers and laid siege to the city of Fume. After five days of fighting and 50-some deaths, Gabriel D'Annunzio decided he had finally had enough of war. Perhaps he was scared of dying himself, or perhaps he just had no stomach for fighting his fellow Italians. He left the city. One supporter later wrote, descriptively, under a deluge of flowers, he forces his way through a city in tears. The failure of his fume ventures seems to have drained Gabriel of much of his remaining energy. He was allowed back into Italy with a squad of his cult-like followers, and he ordered them to find him a home with a grand piano, a bathroom, a laundry, plenty of wood, and coal in an enclosed garden. He told them, if within eight days none of you have found a suitable house for me, I shall throw myself into the canal. Jesus. <laughs> Unfortunately, they found him a place, and he occupied it for three years or so, until Benito Mussolini's march on Rome ended Italy's quasi-democracy and brought about the establishment of the world's first fascist state. 
Mussolini's Italy and the tactics he used to present himself to the people were deeply based in things he'd learned from Gabriel D'Annunzio, and the poet knew it. In one letter to Mussolini, he wrote, Am I not the precursor of all that is good about fascism? I... I'm just speechless, honestly. Like, first of all, Away with yeah. dr- dramatic guy, a very dramatic thing. Very, like, fi- very me, dramatic find guy. Find me a house yeah. where I'm going to just throw myself, kill myself. Um, yeah, but like he really, I hate to say it, but like he thinks he's good at everything, and he kind of was. The like he was very, very much into Nietzsche and like mm-hmm. Nietzsche's idea of the Ubermensch. And it's one of those guys where it's like, life didn't prove him wrong. Like, yeah. if you believe you're a superior being and you live this guy's life, it's kind of hard not to remain convinced of that. That's what I <laughs> like, meant earlier when I mentioned that, yeah. like, I, I get this uh, this feeling of, like, the self-fulfilling prophecy of, like, if you think you're invincible, then you actually will get away with anything and will be, and will be invincible. Obviously, it doesn't work yeah. all the time. But with this case, having lived your entire yeah. life this way, since you were a literal baby... God. You know, it, it's one of the things that's interesting to me, this guy being Italian and being very obsessed with like ancient Rome and mm-hmm. Roman iconography. Uh, the, the ancient Romans had um, a strategy for dealing with, as most cultures had to develop some sort of strategy for trying to deal with runaway egos because it's dangerous when somebody's ego gets this out of control, which yeah. is Denunzio's whole life is a lesson in that. Um, so they would have these things called triumphs when like a Roman general won a particularly great victory. He would be allowed to go on this massive parade through the city. He was basically dictator for a day. Everybody almost worshipped him for like a a day and they knew that this was dangerous because it really got on someone's ego so while this guy is like the center of the entire like Roman uh, Republic and then Empire's attention the whole day there's a guy whose job is to stand next to him and repeatedly whisper into his ear basically you're gonna die at some point you're going to die like remember you're going to die you're just a man and you're going to die like like wow Someone should have been doing that for Denuncio. Yeah, someone must should have been saying. grounding this person yeah. really deep into yeah. the ground. Damn. Yeah. That's a crazy little... I know that about the... Yeah, it's a cool bit of history. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, you know what isn't the precursor of all that's good about fascism, Shireen? Sponsors. And that's right. That people is that right. help Robert stay Roberto mm-hmm. the Italian. Sorry. Unless you believe in the theory that fascism is the inevitable descendant of capitalism because capital will always resort to authoritarian means to preserve itself in the face of uh, civil unrest, um, in which case, well, let's just go to ads. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not linger on that one too much. <laughs> We're, We're back. So. Hi. Mussolini is in charge of Italy now. Uh, and he well understood the value of using someone like Gabriel. Uh, D'Annunzio was too famous and popular to ignore. And so Il Duce trotted D'Annunzio out for public events and made sure everybody saw the poet embracing him and his new regime. In private, Gabriel hated this. He saw Mussolini as an imitation, and his enormous ego could not stand the insinuation that he had merely prepared the way for some other greater Italian leader. Under Mussolini, the Italian state gifted Gabriel a massive mansion, money, and regularly sent him bizarre gifts, including half of an actual battleship, which he set up on his lawn like a gazebo. He continued to host parties and socialize, but over the next decade and change, his health gradually declined. He died in 1938 at age 74. Personally, Gabriel disagreed with most of the decisions Mussolini made. He particularly hated the alliance with Hitler, who D'Annunzio saw correctly as a monster and a fool. He was briefly courted by the anti-fascist resistance in Italy as a possible foil to Mussolini. But if that was ever something that would have interested D'Annunzio, he was far too old to try. I quoted Count Sforza a little earlier. That was from an obituary he wrote titled D'Annunzio, Inventor of Fascism in 1938. And I want to read you how it opens. The War of 1914 to 1918 left in its wake to a certain extent everywhere, and especially in Italy and Germany, a new category of white-collar proletarians who saw themselves as troubled wreckage in a society in which capitalism and the world of the working man seemed equally hostile to them. By a strange paradox, it was Gabriel D'Annunzio, whose lyric richness had been so splendid, and who became the poet and the prophet of all these pathetic misfits. It was he who was the real inventor of fascism. Sforza goes on to note, quote, It was D'Annunzio who invented those dialogues with the crowd, which fascism later on found so useful at the Piazza di Venezia in Rome. 
To whom shall Fume belong? Denunzio called down from the Capitol balcony, and the mob of volunteers who had invaded Fume thundered from below. To us! And the poet dictator. And Italy? And the mob once more. Anwa! To us! This to us later gave the key to the real love of Denunzio for the fatherland, a love of possession, not a love of devotion and sacrifice. Lucy Hughes Hallett writes, though Denunzio was not a fascist, fascism was Denunzian. And I think that really gets at the core of it. He yeah. personally was a, a weirder, more complicated guy. He didn't mean to invent fascism, but the way that he addressed the crowd, the way that he worked with the crowd, the way that he riled people up, um, the iconography he used, like the way that his soldiers were dressed in like these black leather uniforms was copied both by Mussolini's stormtroopers and later mm-hmm. the SS, the salute that he invented. You know, and he's he's exchanging dozens and dozens of letters with Mussolini before yeah. the man rises to power. Like there, in and, and Mussolini's march on Rome is very much an imitation of of Denunzio's march on Fume. Like he he didn't purposefully invent fascism because of the man he was. He created it as a byproduct of his ego. Yeah. Well, what what, what date? What year did he die? Nineteen thirty-eight, right before the war started. Because. I know at the time, uh, like Mussolini in particular, he was maybe one of the first people to really utilize the film industry in his propaganda. Like he like made an entire film studio and just used it in the late 30s. I think it was 37 to literally just make propaganda for fascism. And there were just so many pro-war films that were made. Uh, Like the the declaration against the Allied forces was also like under the film studio that he like established. But I think that union of film and politics, I, I have to say, like, probably Denunzio yeah. paved that way to, like, this artistic union of yeah. of politics and, like, like creative art. Uh, the, the, f- yeah. the first thing he established in Fume, once he was in control, was a press office. Like, yeah. he was a little too early to really take advantage of television. Um, I mean, he was, he was filmed a number of times, like he clearly saw the potential, but he was a propagandist from the beginning. Like that was what he decided his, his involvement in war should be. And I I think he was just a little too old to have become a fascist dictator. If he'd been born a bit later, Mm -hmm. the man he was, the kind of, uh, you know, charisma he had, the energy he had, I think that's the kind of path he would have been on. It was just a little bit early and he was raised in too different of a time to have really wanted that as much. I agree. I agree. I think like... Mussolini is like a, a version of like what he could have not yeah. like become, but like it's very, I don't know. What Mussolini, Mussolini, Mussolini caricatured to, him. Yeah, yeah. Mussolini pretended to be him. And it, it's said that like a lot of people say that like Denunzio is kind of what turned, Mussolini was a socialist initially. Mm-hmm. And Denunzio kind of converted him away from that. And then Mussolini deliberately aped uh, Denunzio's like affectations, the way he f- spoke to crowds, the way he addressed people, the way he patterned himself, um, and just did it with a little bit more um, of a modern tinge to it and more use of things like television and the radio. Um, and, you know, then Hitler iterated from that. Yeah. And that was like, yeah, that's that. Imitation flattery, same thing, you know? Yeah. Like, And I think Mussolini and Hitler, they both used the mouthpiece of their generation, which was like this new f- yeah. like filmmaking and, and, it, and it, and it was film and propaganda. And, um, if they were born at the time of, of Denunzio with poetry, I'm sure it would have been that too. But, uh, it's interesting because what Mussolini did with filmmaking in Italy was really fascinating and like disturbing at the same time. Yeah. Um, but I think if, I think you're right. I think if Denunzio was born a little bit later, he would have used that mouthpiece the same way he used poetry just to garner worship and fame and use, um, his like poetic verse in a different way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty cool story. I'm really intrigued. Like I... There's, yeah. he's genuinely what you said earlier I agree with like maybe one of the most fascinating people to have ever lived like his life at yeah. every turn was more absurd than the last yeah it's uh, kind of hard to really wrap your head around like oh. how much this guy did how bold he was how awful he was like he um, did so much and he, he was did so, so monstrous much. <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> and I had to leave out so much just oh, like sure. make this a comprehensible episode. Like I really recommend the the biography by Lucy Hughes Howlett, uh, Gabriel D'Annunzio, poet, seducer, and preacher of war. It's fantastic. And he is just absolutely a fascinating piece of shit. Um, <laughs> yes, a fascinating piece of shit. I would agree with that. Wow. Yeah, he's right up there with L. Ron Hubbard in my list of like, fuck, what a life. <laughs> Genuinely, what a life. He got away with yeah, all of it. What a life. He got away he with got all away of it. With and I'm sure he still has everything. a billion of fans out there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure he has, like, his yeah. work is obviously respected still. He's still deemed yeah, as a great his, poet. His, yeah, his poetry, his books have kind of fallen out of favor and are seen as sort of like, you know, they were great. They were good in their time and respecting their time. They haven't really continued to have legs. I think his poetry does still have legs. Mm-hmm. He's still highly regarded as a poet. Um, I'm obviously not equipped or qualified to comment on Italian poetry or his right. place in there, but a lot of experts put him as regard him highly in that field. Um, yeah, it's something else, huh? Yeah, I'm... Uh... I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And I don't know. I hate how indestructible he was. I really hate that. Uh, But I mean, that's life, I guess. (laughs) It's one of those things. It's hard to even get that. Like, he does end his life kind of unhappily. Like, Mussolini doesn't care about him or respect him. He uses Mm -hmm. his, his tactics and, like... Uh, sort of treats him as a uh, like a like, like a, a pet almost like yeah brings him out to like burnish the regime's credibility but ignores him and what he has to say mm-hmm. and it's really like bums out and infuriates Denunzio but it's hard to take too much joy in that because it means Mussolini's in charge <laughs> yeah and we don't win either way we don't win yeah. either way wait wait what There's how n- did he die what was the cause of death Oh, I think it was like a stroke or some shit. He's oh, just an okay. old di- old man, you know. I hate so old natural who, fucking causes. Not even like a sex yeah, disease. He didn't die from. Ru- it. He didn't. There's rumors he was poisoned by a Nazi agent. Oh, but I don't. I don't hear. I don't. I don't know, see any evidence behind them. Hmm. I think it's more likely he was an old man who had horribly advanced syphilis and had been doing cocaine for like a decade straight or more like for probably for decades but i mean even with all that even with the syphilis and the cocaine to make it to 70 like yeah that's a full life he had a good run he had a good run damn he had a very full life yeah wow he didn't leave anything on the table you can say that wow so Shireen, yes. Robert. Has this influenced your own your own desires in your career as a as a poet? <sighs> Trying to figure out the best way to it's been a long propagandize time since my poetry. Led an armed, you, know? <laughs> you could lead an armed march on the city of Fume. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while since there was a poet that I don't know was yeah. worshipped. I, I I'm yeah. I'll audition for that role. I'll be yeah. You know, wow. Yep. I don't know poetry. I mean. I, I I love poetry. Poetry's powerful, but he he Not really as, he really went a different yeah. route with it, didn't he? <sighs> yeah, he was a living monument to the power of narcissism. Yeah. Speaking of narcissism, you want to plug your pluggables? Yes, I do. Um, I'm Shireen, and I'm a filmmaker. I'm a poet, and I also co-host Ethnically Ambiguous on the iHeartRadio Network. You can it's on every uh, podcast app. Go listen to it on your favorite one if you want to. And um, I'm Shiro Hero on Instagram, S H E E R O H E R O, and then on Twitter, it's Shiro Hero six six six. And I have a poetry book on Amazon called Dime Piece, uh, like the like a coin dime, and then piece like a piece of a puzzle. And then I'm making my next one, so stay tuned for that if you want. Watch my stuff. I don't fucking care. Just uh, be nice to me. <laughs> You can find me on the twits and the grams and the twinstagrams at uh, Behind the Bastards. Uh, well, nope, that's not where you can find me. You can find me on the Twitters at uh, I Write Okay. You can find this podcast on the Twitters and the grams at Bastards Pod. Uh, you can find us on the internet at BehindTheBastards.com. Um, and you can find your way uh, into having uh, an immortal impact on the future by joining my upcoming cult. Um, It's going to be a really good time. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to lead a march on, I don't know, what city would be easy to capture? Um, I feel like Sacramento wouldn't put up a fight. (laughs) Roseville. (laughs) Roseville? Roseville. Stockton. We'll, We'll continue. Yeah, you hit us up on Twitter with which city you think we should lead an armed march on yeah. um, to conquer. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll figure it out. Um, 
that's the fucking episode yeah thanks for having me it's Go. uh i always thanks learn so much on. i always leave feeling <laughs> so dead inside uh didn't think it was possible to get that's, more dead inside but you know what with this podcast it is <laughs> make, uh, make yeah. america feel dead inside again yeah that's the tagline to this uh, podcast right sophie we need to get some hats made no <laughs> Episode over. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on. <laughs> <laughs>